man, what a night. And what a great season for this team. An amazing end to an improbable comeback. Wait, I think I'm forgetting something. What was the point of this whole thing? To make the playoffs, right? Well, I wonder how they did. Well, that was rather anticlimactic. Yeah, the Rays got beat by the Rangers again. They looked promising with a big 9-0 win in Game 1, only to lose the next three games, as the Rays would go home once again, unable to get out of the ALDS. A sour note to end the year on for sure, but after everything that happened in Game 162, it isn't that bad. The Tampa Bay Rays cannot continue as it currently exists. Baseball will not survive in downtown St. Petersburg. Those were the words of Stu Sternberg in 2010 in response to low attendance and the possibility of a new stadium, or perhaps moving the team entirely. Heading into their 15th year of existence, the Rays finished dead last in attendance seven years in a row and only three times were outside the bottom three. This trend would continue into the 2010s, as from 2012 to 2019, the Rays would be at the bottom all but once. People were beginning to take notice of the poor figures, and there are many potential reasons. The easiest is to pin the blame on the fans for not being passionate enough or willing enough to go to games. However, the root of the problem is deeper than that. Tropicana Field's location in downtown St. Pete had them screwed from the get-go, having the lowest population within a 30-minute radius of any team, with most fans coming in from Tampa and having to cross the nightmarish Howard Franklin Bridge. Seriously, that bridge is an absolute hellhole. Due to this, Stu mentions how they're looking for places in St. Pete and Tampa for a new stadium. However, we also have to talk about another important factor. The fact that St. Pete and Tampa don't necessarily like each other. With all the major development happening in Tampa, with the Buck Stadium and the McDill Air Force Base, St. Pete fought back by bringing in spring training games. Throughout the long process of bringing a team to Tampa Bay, Pinellas and Hillsborough counties were at each other's throats. And even now, getting any work done together is a tough bargain. Nonetheless, Sternberg assures the Rays will play out their lease until it expires after the 2027 season, giving them plenty of time to find a compromise. Right? Back on the field... The team had some retooling to do after another disappointing postseason. John Jaso was sent to Seattle, and to replace him, Jose Molina was signed. Fernando Rodney was also brought in to help out the bullpen, a man who can get up to some shenanigans at times. Once in 09, after a save, he threw the ball from the field all the way into the press box. Impressive, but it also landed him a three-game suspension. The Rays also brought back Carlos Pena, though, spoilers, he kind of sucks now, but at least he can still hit homers. The Rays had high expectations this year, looking to once again compete for the division crown. And things started out well enough, going 35-25 and 25 in their first 60, but New York and Baltimore were hot on their tail. Zobrist was having another great year, and the pitching staff was absolutely electric with Price having his best season, ultimately winning the Cy Young. Rodney also casually saved 48 games with an ERA of .6. Yeah, .6. The second lowest ERA of any reliever who threw at least 50 innings. Ever. However, disaster would strike, as Longoria would go down with a torn hamstring, and would miss most of the season. He would return later, but only as a DH, and his presence would be sorely missed, as offensive pickups like Pena and Luke Scott 
failed spectacularly. Not even the defense was safe, as nobody for the life of them could play shortstop. Rodriguez, Reed Brignac, and Elliot Johnson were all terrible, forcing Zobers to come over from second base to cover, leading to holes on the field. June and July would see the team treading water, only a few games over 500. But to make matters worse, the Orioles were busy having a great year as they began to gain distance in the division race. And by September, the Rays were once again in the middle of the wildcard race. Unfortunately, their luck would not help them again, as despite MLB introducing a second wildcard team, they were unable to catch the O's and Rangers missing the playoffs. To cap off the cherry on the shit Sunday, the Rays were perfected for the third time in four years, this time by Felix Hernandez and the Mariners. And, oh look, there's John Jaso, catching the game against his former team. Eh, whatever. He would go on to have a good life on the sea. 2012 proved that having sustained success was quite hard and it's very easy to watch a season go to waste, especially troubling when the window was beginning to close. The signs were already there with the departure of Crawford, Bartlett, and Garza back in 2011, but this offseason made it truly seem like the beginning of the end, as they would lose Shields and Davis in a trade with Kansas City, and Upton would sign with the Braves. By 2013, only three players remained from that 08 World Series team, Price, Longoria, and Zobrist. 2013 was the last chance year for this team. With players getting older and more expensive, they had to win now. A sentiment that wasn't exactly expressed as they once again got off to a slow start, going 14 and 18 in their first 32. They remained a 500 team heading into the end of June where they finally started to get their act together. By the end of July, they were once again in the thick of the division hunt. Alex Cobb, who had been a depth piece for quite a while now, had a breakout year, despite almost missing some time when a line drive plunked him right in the head. Matt Moore had also evolved from a bullpen guy to a solid starter. Along with Price and rookie Chris Archer, who, yes, they got from the Garza trade, this tree is still going. The pitching staff was good enough, though Rodney wouldn't end up falling back down to earth. Longoria was able to stay healthy this time around, and along with new pickups Kelly Johnson and James Loney, the offense was a smidge better than 2012. I mean, hell, they even brought back Delman Young. In September, with Boston running away with the division, the Rays once again shifted focus to the wild card, as they competed with the Indians and Rangers. On a thrilling night against Baltimore, the Rays would win 5-4 to four in 18 innings that ended up giving them good ground heading into the final week of the season. They would finish 91-71, and 71, the same as 2011, but this time they had to play the Rangers in a game 163 to determine the last wild card spot a game that once again had Longoria's fingerprints all over it as they cruised to a 5-2 victory. Then in the wildcard game, Alex Cobb would put up a masterful performance, shutting out Cleveland to get back to the ALDS against an old rival. The Boston Red Sox, who I guess were pretty mad after 2008 and 2011, looked to get their revenge, and in the first game, they went off, crushing Matt Moore and the Rays 12-2. In game two, after getting into a hole early, the Rays made a good effort, scoring three in the fifth and sixth to cuff the deficit to 6-4. to four. However, they weren't able to complete the comeback as a David Ortiz homer signaled the end of this game. Price, upon taking the loss, proceeded to respond very calmly and professionally, 
by ranting on Twitter and responding to haters, even calling TBS commentators nerds. Oh, damn, what an insult. His girlfriend, Tiffany Nicole, also had some lovely things to say about Boston fans. As she tweeted, Convinced that there must be a written rule in order to be a Red Sox fan, you have to be a complete and utter piece of shit. Wow! Yeah, uh, great look, guys. He would apologize the next day and walk back his comments, especially to Ortiz, who he took offense to staring at his homer, but apparently they talked it out. With the Rays down once again in Game 3, Longoria was able to get the team going with a three-run bomb to tie the game, and later, a Delman Young sack ground out gave them the lead. However, as Rodney came in for the save, Boston got men on second and third with one out, and another grounder brought in the tying run. They were able to get out of it without giving up anything else, and then in the bottom half, with the season on the line, Jose Labaton delivered. Swing and a high fly ball! Right center field! Get out of here! It is gone! Flash down! It's ice cream time! Game four was a close affair, with the game scoreless heading into the sixth, where David De Jesus would drive in Yunel Escobar to take the lead. A lead that would be instantly squandered as a wild pitch and a single from Jake McGee gave it right back to Boston, and they never looked back. It was perhaps the end of an era in Tampa Bay, as while the Rays did enjoy their first bit of success as a franchise, their time had passed. Hey, things weren't all bad. I mean, we did get DJ Kitty. That's something, I guess. Well, the bad news is that the Rays did not make the playoffs in 2014. Or 2015, or 2016, or 2017. The good news, though, is that they weren't nearly as bad as those Devil Rays years. Welcome to the Age of Mid. Yeah, there isn't really a point going super in-depth into these years. This was the time of transition from the old to the new. And it began with one man. Kevin Kiermaier also known as the sexiest man in baseball, was drafted in 2010 and played his first full season in 2014. And while his hitting wasn't anything crazy, his fielding was exceptional, landing him three gold gloves and a platinum glove during his time with the Rays. In 2015, he would lead the league in defensive runs saved, although he wasn't able to save this one as he leapt up the fence to rob a home run only to realize the ball had hit the catwalk and was ruled a homer due to the Trop's lovely catwalk rules. He would be one of the premier center fielders of the league during this time, and one of the few bright spots as the team hovered around mediocrity. In June of 2014, the team dropped to 24-42, and the worst record they had in years, but they were able to turn it around somewhat finishing 77 and 85, which, hey, was better than Boston. 2014 would also turn into a somber year, as the Rays looked to honor one of the greatest men in their organization. Don Zimmer was a fine enough ball player, playing for a bunch of teams in the 50s and 60s, but after he retired, he had a long and successful coaching career. He bounced around from a bunch of teams, the Expos, Padres, Red Sox, Cubs, Giants, Rockies, and Yankees, before ending up in Tampa Bay in 2004 as a senior advisor. During his time with the team, he would become very respected due to his long history with baseball, as every year he would increment his jersey number. In 2014, he reached 66 years of playing slash coaching in the major leagues. On June 4th, he died in Dunedin, not far from his home in Seminole, and the rest of the season was played in his honor. The next year, the Rays would retire his number 66, and in 2023, with the introduction of the Rays Hall of Fame, Zimmer became the first inductee. 
pitching injuries is what ultimately killed their chances this year, as Moore would go down early and miss the entire season, and they would have to resort to Eric Berdard and a regressed Jeremy Hellickson to fill out the rotation. At the deadline, and just after another all-star appearance, David Price was traded to the Tigers, getting Nick Franklin and Drew Smiley, a trade that didn't really work out very well, as Price would serve some solid time in Detroit and later Boston before finishing his career with the Dodgers. Zobrist would have another solid year, but his contract was finally starting to catch up to him, and in the offseason, he was traded along with Yunel Escobar to Oakland leaving Longoria as the last remaining remnant of the 08 squad. Zobrist at least got a happy ending, as he would win two World Series with the Royals and Cubs, even winning MVP with the latter. Along with them, a whole bunch of other people were shipped off, including Hellickson, Molina, Rodriguez, Joyce, and Will Myers. Friedman, the long-running GM, also departed for Los Angeles and was replaced by Eric Neander. To top it off, Madden was let go, ending his eight-year tenure with the team. And his replacement was none other than... Kevin Cash? Aw, you gotta be fucking kidding me. With the old guard gone, someone had to step up to be the new number one pitcher. And that man was Chris Archer, who had begun rounding into form in 2015, and earned an all-star nomination here and 2017. His performance was also enough to get him Cy Young votes, as he helped lead the way for a bunch of random people, including Jake Odorizzi, Drew Smiley, and Matt Andrees. Moore would fall down the rotation as he got older, and in 2016, he was sent to the Giants. The pitching ended up carrying the team out of the basement, as the offense went absolutely cold during this time. In 2015, 16, and 17, they scored the second fewest runs in the American League. And although guys like Logan Forsyth and the ever reliable Longoria continued to produce, the lineup continued to be the embodiment of mediocre as the playoff drought continued. As the years continued, Sternberg and his team were having increasing difficulties trying to build a new stadium. Not one, but two waterfront stadiums were pitched in St. Pete, but both were abandoned early on in planning. The city knew it, the team knew it, even new commissioner Rob Manfred knew it. The Rays needed a new stadium, and they needed it soon. But with options beginning to run out, and with attendance continuing to dwindle, Sternberg began discussing relocation. A group from Montreal had expressed interest, and Stu had been in contact with them as far back as 2014, and it seemed that if things weren't going to work out here, the Rays would be on the move. St. Pete was, however, willing to grant a period where the Rays could look to Tampa for stadium sites until the end of 2018, so the team once again got to work. March of 2016 saw the Rays once again playing in international waters as they played in Cuba against their national team, a moment that also saw the first presidential visit in 88 years. The Rays would win that day, and 2016 began as more of the same, with a 31-32 record in mid-June. But then, the wheels fell off, and the team utterly self-destructed. From June 16th to July 16th, the Rays lost 24 out of 27, plummeting them down to the bottom of the division, and they never recovered. Alex Cobb, who had gotten Tommy John the year before, was only able to play five games this year, and Archer, Moore, and Smiley all regressed after 2015. With the additions of Brad Miller, Corey Dickerson, and Logan Morrison, the Rays set a new franchise record for 216 homers, which sounds great until you realize that 136 of those were solo shots while putting up the worst batting average in the league. Dickerson would underperform 
and Morrison would miss a good chunk of time due to a wrist injury. But Miller did well enough in his first year, hitting 30 homers. The real bright spot came in new closer Alex Colme, putting up 37 saves and a 1.91 ERA, being the team's only all-star nomination this year. The pieces, once again, were there, but they still needed more to reform into a solid team. They once again sputtered into a mediocre season in 2017, but there was hope to be found. Steven Souza Jr., after having two underwhelming years, had a solid campaign, hitting 30 homers, and Logan Morrison was able to bounce back and have a productive year. Kiermaier had another great year as usual, despite injuries holding him back somewhat, and Longo was still doing Longo things, leading the team in RBIs. Aside from that, there wasn't much else in the hitting department. Miller had a huge fall off. Dickerson had a great first half, earning him an all-star nom, then completely fell off in the second. And all in all, the offense still couldn't keep up with league standards. The pitching, however, had transformed into one of the best in baseball, with Archer and Cobb continuing to put up great numbers. Colome, despite having a down year, was still putting good weight as the closer and guys like Tommy Hunter, Jose Alvarado, and Chase Whiteley were beginning to form the pieces of a solid bullpen. December 20th, 2017. A day that many dreaded would happen, but also a day that seemed inevitable. Evan Longoria, the face of the franchise, and the greatest man to ever play for the Rays, was traded to the San Francisco Giants in exchange for Denard Spann, Christian Arroyo, and prospects. It was a deal that financially made sense as Longo was set to make $14 million in 2018. And with the Rays being as stingy as ever, it seemed fit to deal away their aging third baseman. But of course, trading away the face of the franchise hurts a lot. I remember the day the deal was announced I was shocked. I think every Rays fan was shocked. We thought we would see Longo retire as a Ray, and now here he was being sent to the other side of the country. And the pieces they got in return didn't help matters. Span was sent off not long after, and Arroyo only put up okay numbers before he too was traded. Longoria, on the other hand, despite having a down year in San Francisco, still played better than those two guys and he continued to fill in as a leader in the other Bay Area. In 2023, he would sign with the Diamondbacks, who would go on a crazy run, as Longo ultimately got the last laugh against Philly in the NLCS to reach the World Series once again, only to lose the exact same way the last one went. With Longo gone, the team was entirely focused on the future, with Souza Jr. and Dickerson also being traded, and Cobb leaving in free agency. In return, the Rays saw the emergence of Tommy Pham and Willie Adamas, as well as getting Joey Wendell from Oakland. That 2018 lineup looks almost unrecognizable, with a whole bunch of guys with varying levels of success. With all these players being sent away, many expected the Rays to absolutely suck. And indeed, it looked that way as they got off to a 3-12 start. But they were able to turn it around somewhat. And entering the All-Star break, they were a couple games over 500. It was then that the Rays had a great second half, going 41-25, and including a 19-9 September en route to winning 90 games for the first time since 2013. Sure, they missed the playoffs again, but hope was plentiful in Tampa Bay as it seemed the Rays were finally able to contend for the American League title. The offense, while still being feeble at times, was better than 2017, at least by a little bit. On July 31st, the Rays continued the trend of change by sending away Chris Archer to the Pirates, in return getting Austin Meadows, Tyler Glasnow, and another player to be named later. An alright trade, surely this won't blow up in Pittsburgh's face. It also continued the glorious Delman Young trade tree, long after the man had already retired. The pitching staff continued to be elite, 
thanks to the help of one man. Meet Blake Snell, star pitcher and boisterous Twitch streamer. While he made his debut in 2016, it wasn't until 2018 that he suddenly transformed into one of the best of the league. His 2018 season is absolutely crazy, as he posted a 1.89 ERA, holy shit, easily winning him the Cy Young. Outside of him, yeah, the rest of the rotation was just okay, but the bullpen was also killer. Alvarado, Diego Castillo, Chaz Rowe, and Ryan Stanek were forming one of the best bullpens in baseball. In fact, their strong bullpen is what helped them accomplish their new strategy, the opener. With Archer gone, Snow missing some time, and Nate Valdi being shipped away, the rotation was looking rather empty. But instead of scrambling to find some scrim blow to fill in, the Rays would stack relievers in a bullpen day where one man opens the game by throwing a couple innings before handing it off to a bulk guy. This strategy turned out to be quite effective as the bullpen was flexible enough to adapt and bump the raise up a bit. 2018 also saw the most ambitious stadium proposal to date, a site in Ybor City, a monster $892 million project. The renderings sure looked incredible, but the question of funding once again entered the conversation, and the team was unable to scrounge up enough funds, as Stu expected taxpayers to cover most of the cost. Support for the proposal quickly dwindled, and in December, the project was cancelled, and the Rays' chance to build a ballpark in Tampa ended as well, as St. Pete had given up on their agreement to allow the Rays to look elsewhere. Only nine seasons remained before the lease ended and time was running out. The pieces are falling into place. Yandy Diaz and Cole Solcer from Cleveland, signing Charlie Morton to a two-year deal, signing Mike Zanino, Brandon Lau and G-Man Choi coming in as starters, signing Snell to an extension, bringing in Travis Darno. 2019 was the year to re-emerge as contenders, and the team did just that. A 19-9 start to the season was proof that things were in the right direction and the momentum would continue into the All-Star break, as they sat 52-39, and 39, once again in the middle of the wildcard race. Brandon Lau, in his first full season, played well enough to earn him an All-Star nom, as well as Charlie Morton and Austin Meadows, who would lead the team in homers this year with 33. Gone were the days of the feeble squad, this offense actually had some serious firepower. The pitching staff continued to dominate, posting the best record in the AL behind Morton, Snell, Glasnow, and Yanni Chirinos. And the bullpen featured weapons like Jalen Beeks, Oliver Drake, and Emilio Pagan. By the end of July, the Rays also added Jesus Aguilar and were tied with Oakland for the last wildcard spot. The end of July also saw an interesting case, where the Rays were up 9-2 only to blow it to the Jays only for them to come back and win from an 8-1 to deficit the very next day. As the season drew on, wins were needed as much as possible to remain in the race, as despite having a good August, they entered the final month of the season on the outside looking in. A crucial sweep against Cleveland helped them out, and then facing a sweep against the Dodgers, Choi and Darneau would deliver in the ninth to tie it and Meadows would finish it off with a go-ahead homer, giving them a big win. About a week later, on the 24th, the Rays once again saw a similar dilemma with an intense extra innings game against the Yankees. Cleveland had already won, so the Rays would need a win here to keep their wildcard spot intact. And in the 12th, Joy would once again give the Rays the win. There's a shot back into right field. That's got carry. Win it in 12. 
Heading into the 27th, the Rays just needed a win and a Cleveland loss to clinch. And after the Indians lost to the Nats, the Rays took care of business in Toronto, clinching their first playoff berth since 2013. It was a time of excitement in Tampa Bay, as the Rays put up 96 wins and had the tools to go the distance, though the road would be tough as the second wild card. Though, of course, leave it to Stu and co. to ruin the fun with their bullshit. In the midst of the season, with the team still very much playing good ball, Stu announced his most asinine plan yet. To split the team with Montreal and have them play in Tampa for the first half of their home games, and then play the second half and postseason in Montreal. If this sounds insane, that's because it should. The man who can't even get one stadium deal now thinks he can get two? Of course, this can also be seen as an effort to increase pressure on the city, which it most definitely was. But leave it to Stu to continually double down on this stupid plan. The fact of the matter was, there were fans in the Bay Area. Their TV ratings continually rank among the best in baseball. If the stadium was actually in a real downtown area, even in downtown St. Pete, it would help a lot. Nonetheless, despite the great baseball the Rays would put on in the future, this Montreal cloud of horseshit would hover over the team for the next few years, as the end of the lease grew nearer and nearer. 2019 also saw the death of Vince DiMoli, the man who brought the team to Tampa Bay. Sure, his tenure's owner was less than stellar, but his impact cannot be denied, as likely without him, there would be no Rays. Entering the wildcard game, the Rays faced off against the Oakland A's, with a raucous 54,000 strong crowd to back them up. However, they wouldn't shake the Rays, as they would hit three homers in the first three innings, two from Yandy Diaz. Ramon Laureano was able to get Oakland on the board in the third, but behind Charlie Morton and the dominant bullpen, the Rays would hold firm, as after the fifth, the A's wouldn't get a man passed first for the rest of the game, leading to a Rays win. That'll do it! The Tampa Bay Rays are moving on to a date with the Houston Astros! Things were looking up, but now they had to face the Houston Astros, a team that had just won their first title two years ago, and was poised to make another deep run. They would set the tone early, jumping out to a 6-0 lead in Game 1, and not looking back and being able to withstand a last-ditch effort in Game 2 to go up 2-0, looking to close out this one at the trot. Sure, it's not like most expected the Rays to go far anyway. This was their first playoff appearance with a new core. But this young team wouldn't go down without a fight. Charlie Morton, facing his former team, would throw five innings of one-run ball, as Kiermaier would give the Rays their first lead of the series with a three-run blast. In the fourth, the Rays piled on with a Brandon Lau homer, a double from Meadows, and another hit from Pham, plating four runs as they cruised to a Game 3 win. Game 4 saw the offense pick it up again, as Verlander was lit up in the first by a Pham homer and some clutch hitting to go up 3-0 early. Houston had a chance in the fourth, with Altuve getting on and Alvarez launching a ball to the wall. The speedster that he is, Altuve should have had no trouble scoring here, even from first. But Kiermaier was about to show just how good of a defender he was, as he made a great throw from the wall, and Adames made the perfect relay, throwing it to Darno, who nailed Altuve at the plate. Houston wouldn't get anything going for the rest of the game, and the Rays would force a do-or-die Game 5. Unfortunately, this is where the fun ends, as Class now would struggle mightily in the first, unintentionally tipping his pitches, leading to the Astros scoring four. Garrett Cole and Houston's bullpen was electric, 
holding the Rays to just two hits the entire game. And the Astros won the series in five. A rough outing for sure, but one that still represented a good year, as the Rays got back into the playoff picture and gave the Astros a run for their money. Their new window was only just beginning to open, and with 2020 on the horizon, the Rays geared up for a deep run. Of course, this time came with added pressure, as with each passing year, the likelihood of a new stadium grew smaller and smaller. Even disregarding the stupid Montreal plan, there were other cities chomping at the bit for a baseball team. Charlotte, Portland, Las Vegas, and Nashville were among the spots rumored for the Rays to relocate to. And the Rays had chance after chance to get something done in the Bay Area, but they failed time and time again. Now, as the decade turned to the 2020s, it looked like the Rays, barring one last chance to show something, were set for relocation when their lease expired. The one thing that would deter relocation, of course, would be a championship. And with a team of burgeoning stars and solid depth, they had eight seasons to win it all and save baseball in Tampa Bay.